Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining this panel this afternoon. Um, we're going to be discussing counting the cost of carbon in the maritime sector and specifically talking about how inclusion into the EU ETS will affect maritime and the shipping industry. Now, this is a, a big topic. It's been much talked about over the last couple of years. Um, it's created some confusion. Um, it's created some urgency for some people to take action. It's created a great deal of angst in many people. But there's still a lot about this topic which is not clear. So we're going to try and answer a few of those questions today. Um, I'm very happy to be joined by our panel. So I'll just introduce them to you and you'll get to know them much more during the course of the session. So on the far end, uh, we have Martin Crawford Brunt. Martin's the CEO of Lookout Maritime. Um, he's uh, a specialist in the areas of sustainability and safety in the maritime industry. And today he's also representing the Baltic Exchange. So thank you for joining us, Martin. Uh, next, we have Ellen de Vogt. Ellen is um, a political and regulatory affairs officer, and she is joining us from EEX's Brussels office. Um, Ellen is extremely close to the process going on in the EU and uh, a great source of information for uh, all of us. I bother her very frequently to understand what's going on. She's going to help us understand the regulatory side of things today. So welcome, Ellen. And uh, immediately on my left, we have uh, Kai Miller. Kai Miller is Kai Miller's joining us from Cunanagel in Hamburg, where he works in the corporate sea freight team. And he's a specialist in emissions and fuel matters for Cunanagel. So thank you for joining us, Kai. So we're going to try and cover a number of topics today. Uh, we want to, of course, talk through the regulatory side, you know, exactly what's changing. Um, from regulation. Uh, we're also going to look at the potential impact this will have on the market, what's going to change for the maritime and the shipping sector. We want to talk about the readiness of the industry as well, um, how people are getting ready and what they still need to do. And of course, the big question of who is going to actually end up paying for these changes. To finish off the panel, we're going to focus a little bit on what's still left to do, what do we know, what does the industry need, and what does the industry need to do. And throughout the panel itself, we're also going to try and answer the question of how much of this leads to actual initiatives to decarbonize. So I think this is a regulatory-driven change. I think we'll start on the regulatory topic. So Ellen, I'm going to pick on you and bring you into the conversation straight away. Um, I mean, one of the things that we often hear when we talk to the industry is that people just don't understand the, the political decision-making process for this. So maybe to, to kind of start us off, could you just talk us through where we are in terms of the process to extend the ETS and what the immediate next steps are? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's indeed a question that we get quite often from the industry. It's not always so... Um, self-evident how these processes in Brussels all come about. Um, but m maybe summarizing it very shortly, it starts with a proposal from the European Commission and it ends with an agreement between the Parliament and the Council. Um, now, where we are now, is that we're in the final stage to reach this agreement between the Parliament and the Council. Um, saying this is be because before the summer, both institutions have made very clear and put down officially um, their position on what they think of the initial proposal uh, from the Commission. Um, so from that sense, there's already a bit more clarity because every position and every um, proposal is now on the table. Um, of course, we can't predict exactly when they will reach an agreement or what these agreements will be in detail. Um, especially now, like on the one hand, there's still a a lot of pressure to get this deal closed uh, as soon as possible. Uh, on the other hand, of course, in the EU, there's a lot of going on on the energy markets. Uh, so the priorities might have shifted a, li a little bit. But generally, when talking to people in Brussels, um, there seems to be still this appetite to close 
uh, files within the FIT455 package, uh, of which this one proposal uh, was one part of in 2022. Um, so as I said, there's no agreement yet, but all the, all the positions are on the table. So you can already look a bit if the council and the parliament um, deviates on one detail very, and they're very, very far away from each other, then you know, okay, there's going to be quite some tough negotiations there to find a compromise on this topic. Um, whilst for other topics, you can already see that the parliament and the council actually already quite agree on, on quite a lot of things. And then, you know, okay, they might not have to really dig deep to find a compromise on this specific point. So then we might already appreciate that this might be something that can, that can uh, be implemented or at least in this specific direction. Um, I think if there's one thing that has become really clear on, on this topic, on the maritime extension of, um, on the extension of the ETS to the, to the maritime sector, is that every institution, be it the commission in their initial proposal, but also the council and the parliament, all agree that it should be very ambitious, uh, that the scope should be ambitious, it should be ex intra-European but also extra-European transports. There should be no free allowances from the very start and um, it needs to, to send quite a strong signal to this industry. So uh, from that perspective, it's also what we are always looking for is kind of saying, okay, the market needs this, um, this lead time and this trust and predictability that it's actually going to happen and uh, on the, specifically on the topic of the maritime inclusion in the ETS, that's actually something that all the institutions have been quite strong on their support for. Well, that's not the case for all the topics in the ETS. So, so it's, de it's definitely going to happen, yeah, because, I mean, this is something that people do feedback saying, oh, this won't happen, or it'll be negotiated away or watered down. I mean, your, your opinion is everyone agrees it's, it's going to happen, and it, it will be agreed relatively soon in the... I mean, we don't... <laughs> Nothing is 100%, but if you look in, into what is on the table now, there is none of the negotiators um, disagree with the fact that the maritime sector should be included in the current EU ETS. Um, so if that is a signal that it, that it will happen, I, I don't think there can be a stronger, stronger signal at this stage. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And uh, as you say, despite the fact that things are not fully agreed, you can see from the different proposals the areas of commonality so even though we actually don't know exactly what's going to be in there we can kind of look at it with a reasonable degree of certainty to say you know what do we know about this regulation and what do we and what do we not know and some of those aspects you mentioned about the scope and the ambition mm -hmm. are common to all and so clearly we could probably assume that those are going to form the basis of, of the regulation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a few topics, like one major topic before um, the institutions reached their position was who is supposed to pay to pay the, post, the cost of carbon. I mean, the maritime sector is, is, a, is a global sector. It's a very complex sector. So who will be responsible under the, re the regulation and who will be out to pay the eventual price? So that was one topic that's really like, been very extensively discussed also like, with, the, with the regulators and the indus industry. Um, and this is one of the topics where there's like, seemingly a relative consensus already that whilst um, the regulation would cover the ship owner, it's the ship operator who would be eventually um, expected to pay the cost. Um, this is also quite important, of course, if you start thinking about trading structures and everything behind. But that's, um, so that's one thing that there seems to be kind of a relative consensus. Um, same, for example, with the exact scope of ships. Um, there's already the European MRV regulations so the monitoring and the reporting verification, um, which covers ships above uh, five thousand cross tonnage and that's also the limit that seems to be quite agreed at least at the beginning uh, that these will be the ships that will be covered as well so those are a few of these topics where you can see like okay they're actually already quite aligned yeah. okay so so from that as you say we can start to see the topics where they're quite aligned but I mean the big question the impact what is going to be the impact of this on the industry so we can we can look at it with a fairly high degree of certainty to say this is going to happen it is going to be ambitious in its scope it is going to cover european and extra european voyages and it is going to apply to the vast majority of merchant shipping so what kind of impact does that have on the market so 
I mean, Martin, Kai, you're both in the market in different ways on, on a on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'd like to start to bring both of you into the conversation for this question. So thanks. I think I'm going to talk a bit about the commodity side of the market and leave Kai to talk about the liner or container side. Uh, but I think you've got to be thinking about, let's say, the landed cost of the goods. So what proportion of that is freight? And how inelastic are these, these supply chains? You know, what, how inelastic? We, you know, this morning we, dis we, we discussed the inelasticity of demand. It means that these commodities have to come to Europe in, in one way or another. You know, so, um, I mean, I think taking a wider context, of course, that's going to increase the, the cost of landed goods to the, to the ultimate consumer or the ultimate user of those, of those goods. Um, you know, what impact is it going to have on sort of the maritime business and freight, of course, is, an, is, a, is another question. I mean, it's going to affect something like 12 or 14,000 vessels in the first iteration. And what does that mean for owners and operators? I mean, on one end of the spectrum, some owners are saying, well, we just won't go to Europe, which is a bit of a simplification because if, the, if their end customer tells them the cargo is being discharged in Europe, that's, that's where they're going. But it, it's, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, a very global business. And I think the other thing, you know, and coming back to Ellen's point over here is that, you know, I think the people that make these legislations or the, po or the politicians don't understand the complexity of the industry and don't really understand the many facets of it and the fact that there are a number of separate businesses within the, you know, you know in inverted commas, shipping. So shipping is serving so many various businesses. Uh, they all have different drivers. Um, they all have different um, demands on them. Um, for sure, the UHS is a game changer for regulation in shipping and it brings carbon into focus for, for operators. Um, I think at that I'll leave, leave Kai to talk about the line and container side. Yeah, um, but good uh, afternoon, first of all. I totally agree, the shipping sectors are so fundamentally different, yeah, simply for the kind of cargo. We have 20,000 containers on a container ship and that is 20,000 different prices client connections, and also interests of paying for the carbon burn. And that is marginally different to an oil tanker or a bulk carrier, where you have only a couple of interests in it. From this container perspective, I can only say the majority of our clients is very much interested in paying their share for getting the industry decarbonized, also for one reason that on a per unit basis, the costs are minimal. So if you do a calculation how many shoe boxes fit into one container, it's roughly 3,800 uh, pairs of sneakers, then the uptake is roughly 10 cents per shoe box if you take the current price of carbon of roughly $90. And that is feasible, that can be done. And that is also yeah, motivating us to offer different solutions to our clients or getting transparency into, the, into that market. That is also reflecting, I think, what was said in the morning, that there will not be one fuel in the future for the entire shipping industry. Different trade patterns will require different uh, solutions, also for the land side infrastructure of these new fuels, and there will be different price tags. And we feel very confi uh, confident that with a fair amount of transparency, this retail-related part of shipping users or users of these services will bear the uptake. So, so you, do you have another comment, Martin? Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to add to that. You know, obviously, I, I, you know, for those that aren't familiar with the shipping industry, within the bulk of commodity shipping, there's a split incentive, typically, in terms of who pays for the fuel you know, in terms of then, you know, and we're going to get onto that perhaps in a, in, in, a, in a deeper sense. But that's, of course, really important when you're trying to allocate uh, or understand the, you know, the, the, the cost of, of landed goods and what the incentives are of the various parties to participate in that. And I think, I mean, passing the cost on is, is one thing, and I think this is, you know, broadly expected, isn't it? The cost is going to work its way down the supply chain. Um, but it's the mechanism for doing that as well, which I, I think is a, a point that needs a little bit more discussion. And we certainly have seen in the kind of evolution of the different uh, proposals from the different bodies 
um, a, you know, this kind of growing understanding of the, of the shipping industry. And as you say, you know, Martin, I think um, to begin with, that understanding was, was a bit lacking. But this idea that there will be some kind of contractual obligation to pass the cost from the owner to the operator um, is something that is now included in one of the proposals. And whilst it's, you know, probably welcomed, particularly by the ship owners, um, the complexity of doing it could be, could be quite difficult. Yeah, I think that all that that's served in, in clarifying is who the compliance partner is. So the compliance partner and the person that is going to be, let's say, sat with a regulatory part of that is clearly defined. The other party in terms of the commercial transaction isn't, and there's still quite a, quite a bit of work to be done there to understand how that's going to work and the mechanisms for that. And, you know, maybe Ellen can come in a little bit on that side. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly as Rich has just said, there's the proposal on that on that front, the proposal has developed quite a lot already from what the commission had initially put forward in July 2021. Um, so there has been this discussion and also kind of the appreciation that, that it's a very complex uh, complex sector and maybe more complex than, than some of the other sectors that are already included there. Um, but I think there's also the, at least on, on some side, at least the that the, the feeling that it's appreciated that it's also the industry who may need to find their way on this topic and that they, whilst the, there can be legal certainty, okay, the ship owner is gonna be the compliance sector and they have the legal rights to transfer these costs to the ship operator, it's also up to the industry to see how this fits in the current contracts and how this fits into the, in the current structures and uh, how that can potentially be implemented. Um, yeah. And we've, we've heard a few different ideas for, for models for that right so as you say I think it's very clear that the ship owner at the end of the day is the compliance counterparty and therefore they are going to have to have certificates in their registry account at some point in time um, now one model that we heard which was quite simple was the ship owners would acquire the certificates and then they would pass the cost on to the charterer somehow in the in the charter party um, the other thing we heard was something happening in the reverse direction where the charterers would acquire the certificates and they would then pass them back to the ship owner's registry account, um, also through a different contractual arrangement. But there's a great deal of complexity in both of those models, I think, for the industry to work out. Yes, particularly you know, if you think about comparing and contrasting spot contracts where you're just doing that on a voyage by voyage basis where the freight may be dollars per tonne versus a time charter where let's say the time charter is responsible for the fuel coming back to this split incentive and you know whether this comes as a bunker levy or, or otherwise you know remains to be seen and, and of course the regulation really points to the ship operator as defined by the ism code so that could be a ship manager who has a substantial fleet of ships or it could be a really small company and one of the challenges for those small companies if they're trying to 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 buy the allowances is is whether they're recognized by that counterparty is trying to sell those allowances and will they will they get through the due diligence process in order to do that? So for the smaller owner, you know, there are these matters also of, of timing. So at the end of the voyage, you know, you want to be able to square everything up, but you, st you don't yet have a, have a final price perhaps in terms of what you might pay. So a lot of complexity. Absolutely, and, then, and this is something that we talked about, Kai, as well, and, and something that maybe people don't always appreciate is that sometimes ships don't have a cargo, right? In the bulk markets, you have to relocate the ships in ballast legs. In the liner trades, you know, a big part of the containers that you see on a ship going out of Europe and back to Asia are empty to relocate the equipment, and so there has to be a method for understanding how the costs for carbon associated with those legs is also included. Yeah, that is what we look at at the moment and try to find a mechanism. It is implemented at the moment in the normal price of fuel. And that was actually the intention in the industry over many, many years to optimize the fuel consumption. And now we have again on top of that the price of carbon and to allocate that in the right way, especially in the repositioning, allowing this supply chain solution or logistic services organized in the most efficient way. That is a, yeah, the task for the next couple of years. And um, we try to build a platform also to compare services. Yeah, you can sail fast, slow. At the moment you sail slower, you save fuel and also the emissions. And I tr truly believe 
fact that, uh, yeah, technology will allow us now to materialize on that and avoid these emissions initially. And then the pricing has to be organized in a way over an exchange or um, any other mechanism. And you, you mentioned fuel there, Kai, and I think that's a really important point that we want to pick up on, right? Because when we're talking about the impact to the industry, obviously people are not thinking, well, we'll just continue burning heavy fuel oil and we'll pay the cost of carbon. There's a lot of initiatives to potentially change the fuel types that are available. And Martin, you already said there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. But what do we see coming from the industry around switch over to new fuels and you know, what are they likely to be? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, there's been a lot of work in using, um, done in terms of using LNG as a fuel, including setting up the regulatory environment and the structures and things, perhaps somewhat con con controversial in some areas. But, of course, having been part of that whole process, um, you know, there needs to be an understanding of all of the safety requirements and all the regulatory requirements that need to follow from these new fuels. Um, and they will come and they're needed. Um, but I think also, you know, to Kai's point, I think we need a multi-fuel future. You know, we're, we're going from, let's say, a, the, the previous transitions in this industry were, were to a single new fuel and a single fuel for the industry. We're now going to a multi-fuel future and, and the industry is competing with other industries for the green fuel. You know, so where that is going to end remains to be seen. But what I think is missing from some of the conversations so far is, let's say, the safety, training, regulatory and acceptance aspects of, of these new fuels, all of that means it's going to take some time. So in the meantime, what we need to be much better at is optimizing what we have. Uh, and that's, that's cl clearly evident and important in a high fuel price environment, you know, so we'll see ships slowing down and trying to save fuel if they can, if, you know, if, they, if the market allows them to do that, or their charters or end customers allows that. Um, but I think that's often missing in this conversation. It's a little bit like the offset conversation is, you know, save first, do everything you can to save on the existing fleet and thereafter look at, you know, other measures. And I think these things need to happen in parallel. So it's not one or the other. Um, as part of that, I mean, and, 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 under the, and, and for the Baltic Exchange, we're developing a, a EEOI round voyage indicator, which is really... Um, to describe what good looks like in terms of the efficiency of a voyage so that market participants can use the same benchmark to, um, to evaluate it and can make the right comparisons and the right adjustments and understand, let's say, the carbon component within that voyage because all the feedback we've got is that um, it's very, very important for the market to have a, a sort of a more understandable uh, reference point so that there's a better quality of conversation between the cargo interest and the owner or the operator of the ship. That, um, maybe to add on to, first of all, what fuels are used. So we have a clear regulation in the EU, this RED 1 and 2 directive, where it's exactly outlined um, how these fuels have to look like. And we, we are follow one strategy, that is we want to have these waste-based solutions. Because the funny thing is, mainly in road transportation, also by EU regulation, we have this certain quota of biodiesel, and that is all corn and crop. And I think uh, food for fuel is a per se bad idea initially. And then I think also in shipping, the discussions about what will be the right fuel tomorrow, these discussions go a little bit esoteric these days. And there might be rich technologies, and it is also okay to save 20%, 30%, like it is the case for LNG initially. And an acceptance of a bridge technology, if you know the bridge will come to an end after five years, seven years, 10 years. And I think that is all with the lifetime of the ships, 25 years around, an acceptable time frame where you can agree on a yeah, bridge technology at sea as well as onshore. Because all the land side infrastructure also has to cope with that. Um, yeah, developments which are just started. So, I mean, it's, it's clear then that this process of, of fuel switching, whilst it's already underway and there's a lot of discussion, this takes a lot of time to actually deliver. And, you know, Martin, you said there needs to be regulation around these things and, you know, we need to understand exactly what the right fuels are. So, it's not that that's a solution for the shipping industry to suddenly decarbonize very quickly and then kind of dodge the, the ETS costs. So it's clear that everyone is going to have to be ready 
to participate in the ETS. And I think Martin, you said earlier that there's a vast difference in the size of these organizations. And so readiness, I think, is one of the really key issues, depending on which proposal you read. This is either starting next year um, or in 2024. I mean, how ready do we think the shipping industry is to actually participate in the ETS? Well, based on the conversations that I'm having, not ready at all, really. I think, you know, and but that's not necessarily the fault of the industry. It's also because there isn't any clarity in terms of how you can trade small lots, you know, for instance, and, or, or what the mechanism is. Um, but, you know, I think, um, you know, when you see this in context of some of the other environmental regulation coming in, which, which we, could, we, we could discuss later, it's not as though there's just one thing that the shipping industry has to be grappling with right now, having just come through COVID, having come through, you know, all of the issues with that supply chain shock, um, you know, it's, it's one of those factors that, that, that need to be addressed. And I think traditionally, um, First of all, the industry, I mean, it's, it's very global, I mean, by its nature, and that's seemingly obvious, but, um, but it's also, you know, that the regulations, the regulatory environment tends to be quite fluid. It's not as defined, you know, and I, I'm in a lot of conversations where I try to explain this to people who, who aren't from the industry that, you know, it's more like a set of guidelines and a set of firm regulations and that, that just has to evolve, evolve and that there's, um, consensus required and it pulls in all of the political things between developed and non-developed countries and you know all of those things add complexity um, um, to the discussion um, but I think um, you know the average ship owner which represents a fleet of around three or four ships is not ready for EU ETS. You, you mentioned there as well about the, the size issue Right, and about you know whether people can actually trade the size they need. Um, I mean, Ellen, I wanted to just bring you back in a little bit on this point as well. I mean, what is the proposal in terms of the amount of certificates that are going to be added to the ETS for the inclusion of maritime, and how does that kind of compare to the overall market? I mean, we, we're looking a lot at you know maritime's view or how the ETS affects maritime, but I mean, how will maritime? affect the ETS as well? What sort of size are we talking about? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I, I mean, this is also super very interesting for me to, <laughs> to hear so many insights from the industry side to actually also reflect on the, on the regulation. Because I mean, in, I think it's well appreciated that it's, a, that it's a very complex sector. And I think the commission uh, assessed that there would be 1,600 ship owners who would in the end be covered by the ETS. But when talking about how this should actually happen and how they should access the market, I think there's also the agreement that not necessarily all 1,600 of them are going to access the markets themselves, not 1,600 of them are going to access the auctions themselves, which is also totally okay. I mean, if you look at the current sectors which are covered, not nearly all of the industry all of the industry and all of these covered companies are accessing the markets directly now. I mean, there are intermediaries there, there are specific structures set up that can also be reflected for the maritime sector. So from that perspective, that's, there might be quite some things to learn also from the existing structures there. Um, and but when, and when it comes to like the overall um, scope of the ETS and, and the impact there, um, of course, it's a very big deal for the industry, as, as it's very clear. Um, and it's also a big change for the ETS in the sense that it's a completely new sector that's being added. Um, in terms of volumes, it's um, calculated that it would be around 80 million um, tons or 80 million EUAs that would be added to the cap, which if you put it in, in, in kind of the broader perspective of everything that's going to happen to the ETS uh, once this review is over, it's actually it's, it's not it's not so big. Like if you look at it, like the ETS um, proposal initially from the Commission also included kind of a one-off reduction of the cap because there's this oversupply issue of about 170 mil 117 million um, EUAs or tons. So that's already more than what would be added from the maritime sector. There's going to be a new linear reduc reduction factor, the MSR maybe adopted. I mean, there's a lot going on and w that will be going on at the same time. So looking at the volumes and the supply, pers supply perspective, the maritime sector might, adding it, the maritime sector might not be the biggest thing. But of course, it's a completely new sector and there may, might be a need for 
new trading structures and new structures behind it. And it's a big issue for the, for the sector itself. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much. But it, it's clearly not going to flood the EUA market with, with supply, adding this industry in. <laughs> Well, <laughs> if, you, if you look at it from that perspective, uh, no. Uh, especially because, I mean, the current review, it's also, we're talking a lot about the industry needs enough time to adapt. But the purpose of this whole review exercise is to make the ETS ready to achieve 2030, more ambitious 2030 targets. So the whole purpose of this review is to reduce the cap and to reduce emissions towards 2030. I mean, it's already 2022. We can't offer so much more time if if the 2030 targets are what's supposed to be reached, of course. Thanks. Martin, I can just, just to come into that point, I mean, to what extent does maritime affect the ETS? And, and very little is the answer, I think, speaking to somebody who's trading it. It's no, no more than four or five days of trading um, in terms of volume. So volume effect is minimal. Um, but obviously, you know, market effect is something slightly different, right? You know, cost, landed cost, cost of goods to end consumers, look what sanctions have done to the cost of, of products landed in Europe, refined in India, for example. So there are all sorts of these unintended consequences where these things are linked. And I think the other thing is to think about, for instance, supply chain dislocation and what's happened with the, you know, the Ukraine war. That's changed the whole supply pattern. So, you know, are the models that are there adequate to fit for purpose if you get something like that, where suddenly everyone's been trading and then in their, in their lanes and and the, with the logistic supply chains and something like that dislocates all of that and suddenly your suppliers are changing. Look at the amount of thermal coal coming into Europe now as a result of that, which wasn't happening before. So I think these are all things the commission needs to think about. So it could, could be more than the 1,600. You could have the occasional ship that has to dip in or dip out because suddenly they've picked up a cargo and they weren't planning on going to Europe and they suddenly happen, happen to do so. And then think about the tanker industry, especially crude, which is traded multiple times once it's loaded onto the ship. Once the crude's on the ship, it could be traded 100 times before the discharge location, the destination is known. So that ship operator or owner is then going to have to find a way to, um, to address the compliance issue and the cost issue. If we talk about these numbers, here the container sector is uh, responsible for 230 million tons of CO2, roughly. And if you say it's not a big deal that uh, the shipping industry uh, it comes now to the ETS, it's also implicating that it is a very environmentally f mode of transportation, what is good. Yeah? We are very proud of that, that we can move all that cargo, all these huge volumes, with so less emissions, even though we can't trade so much in initially. But it also gives you now an accelerator to say, if we have these low margin business, the CO2 price can be the element which then differentiate between a good and a bad service. So that is exactly what should happen with this price on, uh, on carbon. And we do not need to have these huge amounts to make it work. And we can still solve the problem. So that is also the question, what would we want to do? Will we find a mechanism that the industry collects the money to fund the decarbonization in the next 15, 20, 30 years? Kai, I just wanted to, to, to expand on the, the readiness question with, with you as, as well, right? I mean, coming, coming from the liner industry, when people think about the shipping industry, it's, that's probably the only part of it where there are genuine kind of household names, right? Everyone sees these container ships running around and they have their name on the side and they know who they are. So, I mean, these are generally big organizations. Um, surely these guys can easily get, get ready there. Right? They're not like the average three vessel owner are they are they ready are they are they there so it's a the container sector overall is also differentiated between the east and the west you have the western carriers the eastern uh, or asian asian carriers and i would say it is on both sides different strategies some bet on the lng some say um uh, the methanol hydrogen part will be the way forward and from the cargo side that will be supported from a fraction of people. So I represent roughly five and a half million TEUs, which we do manage. And we are by far the largest player in that market. And then it's thousands and thousands of smaller uh, players, which be, may be not as ready. So we do everything what we can. And I think it is also with the financial service industry or with the offerings you, you have to get, give access to then the 
yeah, different tier players in the market. But the interest over the overall industry and also in the client base is certainly there. Um, Martin, I could see you, you wanted to dive in on something a minute ago. Did you have something to add as well? Um, not at this point, no. I've had another thought. Um, so, I mean, one, one of the points that you mentioned, Kai, as well, was like, actual decarbonisation. And we did say, you know, this, this is a question. So, of course, the idea of the ETS is to create an incentive for industries to decarbonise. And when you look at it from the shipping industry's perspective, of course, the shipping industry is very, very keen to decarbonise. But, I mean, Ellen, I, I want to bring you back in. From the EU's perspective, um, including them into the ETS, do they care whether shipping actually decarbonizes or not, or does it just all kind of go into the pot? I mean, I, I, can, I can speak for the EU, but I, I imagine they care. Uh, I mean, before being an incentive to actually leading to emissions reductions, having a carbon price is also an incentive to actually invest in solutions that will get these reductions. Um, so that's kind of the whole principle of the ETS is to provide this carbon price and to provide this investment signal for also future decarbonization. Uh, but you're, re you're totally right. I mean, the, the, the maritime sector would be added to the current EU ETS. It wouldn't be like the aviation sector who has separate allowances uh, and, a, and a specific pot for the aviation sector. So it would be covered to the, to the one ETS with one type of allowance together with the energy industry and the heavy industry. Um, so with, with the principle of having a cross economical carbon price and having the emissions reductions where it, most, where it is most cost efficient to do so. I mean, the idea of an ETS and especially a cap and trade uh, program where you have this predefined cap of this is all the emissions that can be emitted in the next year and it's going to go down um, is exactly the purpose of, of enabling these reductions where it is most cost efficient to do so and whether that's in the energy sector or in the maritime sector. In principle for the ETS that doesn't make the difference um, but of course it, it's also the purpose of adding them so that they also receive this carbon price investment signal for the future when the price might be at another level. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, to the question of if they care, I think they do, because, you know, to put a positive spin on this, I think shipping can be part of the solution and not seen as part of the problem when you think about supply chains. You know, think about um, incoming focus on scope three emissions, so actually you can decarbonize your supply chain, because obviously, you know, the, some of the, um, uh, you know, the obvious things that aren't being said is, you know, really you should look at, at you know, emissions from a consumption basis and not a production basis, right? And if you start to flip it around, then you start to see that really shipping is is part of the solution. And, and I think um, ship operators and owners really do want to um, want to do better. They're just struggling with, with how because it's very hard to make a commercial, um, to make commercial sense of anything um, doing it right now. And there's a little bit of a let's say, a, a, you know, discussion between the charterer and the owner. So from the charterer's perspective, they're a bit frustrated that the owners aren't doing more. From the owner's, you know, from the owner's perspective, they say, well, we're very happy to do more, but we need to get paid to take that risk. So, so there's a little bit of a, of a gap, let's say, and I think what we need is a better quality of conversation between the cargo interest and the owner to agree how to share, um, share that incentive and, um, you know, that's not an easy conversation, but I think that's very much needed uh, because then you, you align the incentive of both parties and, and you're not trying to roll a rock up a hill. I totally echo that. So it's the same in the retail business. People would like to have the green service at no cost. What we learned over the time is that if you provide a huge amount of transparency, it changes because if you know what you pay for, then you are willing to execute that, that trade or take an, uh, pay an up uh, take for biofuel or other low carbon fuels which might exist in the, in the future. And these conversations will be key. That's Maybe also just adding, of course, I mean, being covered by the ETS is, is, an, is an enormous cost for the industry that comes on top, but it's also a new source of, of revenues and of investment somehow, because of course part of the ETS are the revenues from the auctions, which especially at the current price levels are billions for the member states. And in the, in the current uh, review, there's really strong voices, for example, from the parliament that a, that a specific chunk of these 
uh, revenues should be reserved for the maritime sector and be invested in R&D, in, in fuels. In, so, of course, it's still more cost than anything else, but there's also this other perspective of there are these revenues to invest and to, to, more, to do more R&D also on a European level. Yeah. That would be my, my question. Where's all this money going to? Yeah, so I think, I think, you know, that's music to the ears of the shipping industry to say that some of it's coming back into the industry to fund, you know, development. I think, you know, one of the challenges, of course, is to ensure that this funding goes to the right place and that, and that, that really goes into, in, in, from my perspective, that should be hardware, uh, demonstrators, demonstrators, equipment on ships to bring the safety training um, uh, uh, conversation further and, and, and to actually prove these things. I don't think we really need more desktop studies. We need um, things actually happening on the ships, showing that it's possible and let, let people kick the tires. You know, it was the same conversation with LNG as fuel. I mean, in the early days, there were a lot of suggestions that this was totally irresponsible. It couldn't be, you know, cargo operators couldn't be trusted with it. Um, you know, one project I did when I was at DNV took two years was to convince the, the ports that they could have a cruise ship that en to enter their port with, uh, with LNG as fuel. You know, so I think all of these issues are waiting for us and why, you know, we should, we should sort of front end some of these issues by getting more equipment on the ships. And, and I think, you know, if that ring-fenced funding, when I, I don't think ring-fenced is the word they'd use because no, no uh, Minister of Finance likes that idea. But, but you know, if, if, that, if, if those funds could be then applied or, or brought back into the industry, I think that would actually generate a huge amount of goodwill and will really move things in the right direction. But as Kai points out is, you know, a little bit of uncertainty, you know, how that will happen. And then, of course, other jurisdictions might eye this with envy and decide they're going to set up their own ETS schemes. You know, very likely that, um, you know, manufacturing base like China decides to, to adopt their own because, you know, um, being taxed on the manufacturing of your goods effectively of the cost of your landed goods increased into Europe uh, creates, uh, from their perspective, perhaps an uh, unlevel playing field. I mean, and that's that's a really interesting point, right? And um, Ellen, I mean, perhaps you could say something about that in in the regulation. There is scope, isn't there, for um, you know potentially what could happen if other jurisdictions have a similar scheme, and indeed what would happen if they don't. Yeah, absolutely. I think. I mean, looking at the communications from the EU on the ETS, um, including a sector, a global sector like the maritime one, is, is definitely also an intended incentive towards other jurisdictions to do the same thing. Uh, it's also the explanation of, okay, 100% of the voyages within the EU would be covered, and, pro and the pro initial proposal read, and 50% of voyages coming in and out of the EU, with also the message, because the EU is responsible, or the country where it eventually goes to, is responsible for 50%, but that should also be an incentive to, okay, the third country where the voyage comes from or where it goes to should then be able to cover the other 50% because that's their responsibility. So there's very, I mean, explicitly kind of this hope of the, or this intent to have other jurisdictions adopt the same. But of course also, I mean, every, um, I think I haven't talked to uh, anyone yet who doesn't agree <laughs> that, a, that a global price or a global initiative would be the, 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 the ideal solution if, if that can be done in a, very, in a trustworthy manner, in a, in a manner where, uh, where it really has an effect. Um, so within the current proposals, there's also uh, quite the opening for the IMO, for example. Should the IMO uh, take a... Take take a step and uh, initiate the carbon price and a market-based solution that's actually trustworthy and as ambitious as the European one, they seem to be willing to keep that open to, to, to go towards a global solution instead. Um, but then they're not willing to wait for that anymore. That uh, leads to the question, which currency this global solution will be priced in? Maybe the euro, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, it also flags for me the it's the first time in the conversation that we've actually said IMO, right? And we do have this global regulatory authority, which is well proven as the only way to really create regulation in the shipping industry that can be delivered globally. And we we haven't mentioned them, and we've got ten minutes of the of the of the conversation left. I mean, what what is the role for the IMO in this? And you know, does it look like they're working on something that that could fulfil some of these? Um, you know, ideas that Ellen is speaking about, which are in the in the proposals. 
Well, the role for the IMO, obviously, is to develop a global set of standards which all of the member states can sign up to, and, of course, that's part of the challenge. 178-odd member states who are represented by their, let's say, the, the, the politicians from those governments, uh, sitting within a technical organization trying to solve a commercial problem. So I think they've got a massive challenge on their hands, and I, I really hope the IMO can do something. You know, you've got the, the sort of basket of short-term measures, which is the carbon intensity indicators, which we could spend an hour discussing but don't have time for here. Um, as well as, let's say, some of the other proposals like R&D funding, which weren't approved. Um, but definitely the IMO will have to come forward with a, with a more commercially market-based measure approach because, you know, within the recent announcements, you know, the, uh, the EU has left an, a window for the IMO to participate. And if they don't manage within 2027, I think, you know, there are other things in terms of, you know, 400 gross ton um, size, bringing in... Um, you know, uh, methane and other gases, as well as, you know, the potential threat of 100% of the voyage. So, you know, the EU is really putting the challenge back on the IMO to, um, to deliver. Um, uh, but as I said, the construct of the IMO and have greatest respect for what they're trying to do. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I would like to see the IMO succeed, but, but they have a structural uh, difficulty, I think, in, in delivering what is expected now. I think also for the, for the benefit of people who are not so much in the shipping industry, the CII indicator is basically the, uh, a ranking, like if you buy a fridge, yeah, it's going from red to green, and now you should theoretically, in a position, you buy a fridge which is yeah, energy efficient triple A, and it's also um, transported on a service or on a ship which is also in a good green energy consumption. So in the, the basic idea, that's perfect. The only question is, will the consumer then pay these uptake, first of all? And secondly, can you steer it on the right ships? And that is something what translates back to transparency. And um, yeah, technology will allow us to, uh, to, to provide that. I mean, we've got a range of environmental indicators and CII is... is, is wasn't built to be a voyage-based or efficiency indicator, really. It was used as a mechanism to get the whole industry to move in a certain direction through increasingly stringent targets. But unfortunately, doesn't serve the industry or stakeholders very well when you're trying to assess the relative efficiency of a ship or, or a particular voyage. Maybe the best way to describe it, for those who are not familiar, the EEXI is a bit like the specification on your car in terms of miles per gallon that you can expect to get. The CIA is more what you get when you actually drive it. So you can take a very good ship that's driven poorly, which emits a lot more fuel. And the other problem with the CIA is it doesn't really account for the transport work done. So if you want to reduce your CIA, you sail for very long, carrying very little, very long distances carrying very little, which increases your total emissions. So there are a number of complexities to this, and I think uh, increases the importance of having a clear understanding of what good looks like from an efficiency perspective, what is, what is green, um, what does that mean, and what is sustainable, if we come back to the, the overall theme of this, this conference, right? Sustainable is about you know, doing the best you can, setting up your business to succeed in the long run, and I don't think it's a very narrow definition of only one thing that you have to do in order to, to, to be successful, and, um, uh, and, and maybe for now you, ne you need to be you know, optimizing what you have, reduce your real emissions, you know, have a real impact now, um, with, of course, an eye on the future and, and, and um, solving some of the longer, longer term structural issues. Yes, that's a cargo is not reflected in the CII, that is a very big weakness, so I agree on that. Good stuff, right. Well, we're, we're getting very close to the end of the session, so before we kind of wrap it up and do any, any final thoughts. I wanted to hand it over to the audience to see if we have any questions. Um, is there any questions for, for the panelists? Got one at the back there. We've got a microphone floating around behind you, Michael. Guys, thank you very much. I think that's very informative. Um, a big thing that happened in the power industry and the energy sector was the cost of abatement and where it was, um, and I think on EUAs it's somewhere around 70 or 80 euros where it's actually fundamentally important to change the fuel. Now, I was talking to Martin the other day and he said, well, actually, they're going to pass 
that through to the customer base. Well, in theory, the power sector do the same, but is anyone aware of where the EUA price needs to be to really you know, speed up the, um, the fuel change on the shipping industry? Well, I mean, at the moment, there have been various estimates, um, you know, but at current sort of prices and current rates and scaling, it's 250, 300 euros, I think, is, 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 is what's, what's been discussed. So it's substantial premium um, for that. Um, and I guess, you know, if you think about it, really, to solve the emissions problem for scope three emissions to serve industry, 75% of the solution really lies in the, in the development of greener fuels. You know, only, only maybe 25% of that actually related to what's happening on the ship. So I think, you know, emission reduction is very much a team sport. And I think, you know, until we learn to play a team sport and until we try to join these things up, I think we're going to struggle to deliver actual reductions because otherwise all that we're trying to do is to pass that risk on to some other party. And that doesn't work because the commercial realities don't allow it to work. So until parties can share in the upside as well as the downside of this, I think it's going to be, be heavy going. But, you know, there are a number of initiatives to, to build greener fuels and develop greener fuels. I believe they, you know, they will happen. But the big challenge there is scaling them to the point where the pricing actually becomes viable commercially and you can make a commercial argument uh, for that. And I think, I think, you know, that's the challenge we face as an industry. But it's broader than shipping you know, it, it, it feeds into the whole energy industry, which is what we've been discussing today. Okay. Any other thoughts on that, or should we? Yeah, the question is, is the price of the carbon um, uh, the influencing the, the price of the production of the low-carbon fuels, or vice versa? And um, further down the line, with economies of scale in the production of the fuels, the price of carbon has to adjust, and that is where the exchange comes into uh, the play again. Okay. Any other questions in the audience? In that case, what I would do then is just ask our panelists just to give us maybe a final thought. We are very nearly out of time, so if we just keep it keep it to a minute or two each. But I mean, just to, just to sort of round it off, what has to happen next in this journey for you know the shipping industry or from the regulatory perspective to get to this kind of point of clarity that we need to, to start making some of these actions happen. So we'll kick off with you, Martin, we'll just come down the line. I think, the, you know, be, being clear on what good looks like from a voyage perspective so that the participants in that voyage can actually optimize the way they, they operate, you know, and their various initiatives which are operational, you know, as well as technical. I think we're going to need all of these, but starting with what good looks like and a clear understanding of that, I think, is, 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 is absolutely needed. Um, and I think, you know, a clear market signal will be very useful along with a clear regulatory direction. Thank you. Ellen? Yeah, of course, from the uh, political regulatory perspective, what needs to happen next is actually the agreement uh, between the institutions, but maybe also important to appreciate some of the clarity which may already be there and some of the political signals we, which may already be there to kind of see the current timing also as a lead time that the industry would need to have this implemented and rather than keep waiting until the final letter of the law is implemented, also look at what do we know now and what are we working towards, which are the 2030 targets, which is very soon. Yeah. Thanks. And Kai? I also think the regulatory certainty is keen. We are 90% there. We can live with a kind of uh, these last 10% uncertainty, but on the technological side, how do we handle the ammonia? How do, is the hydrogen handled? And all the red tape which is existing in shipping like anywhere else, that has to be bridged, and then I think decisions and investment decisions will be executed. Thanks very much. In that case, that brings us to an end. Thank you all for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed everything that the panelists have said and found it informative. And uh, I believe we can break and there's a uh, coffee and cake available back in the tapestry room. Thanks very much. <laughs>